sides we've garnered from this structure uh, into their evolution. Sorry, I've just got to click on a window. There we go. Um, also, some insights that we've garnered into their evolution based on what we've learned from their structure. And uh, time permitting, um, I've also got a few slides at the end that will talk a little bit about uh, the recent upgrades that we've had to our cryoarm facilities at UQ, um, which may be of interest because we're predominantly using the Joel cryoarm instrumentation now. And I know that that's something that many people don't have much experience with and might be interested to hear something more about. So um, to get started, I'll introduce um, the organism that, that got us interested in these toxins in the first place, which is an organism known as Yersinia entomophaga. So, so this is a member of the Yersinia genus and uh, it's an insect pathogen, which is where it gets the name entomophaga from. And it was first isolated from the disease larvae of the Coleoptera and Costelitra zelandica, which is shown on the left-hand side here. Um, and so this uh, isolation was um, reported in 2011 and it was discovered that this bacterium was a novel gram-negative soil-dwelling bacterium that belongs to the same genus as some of these more well-known um, Yersinia um, species, including Yersinia pestis, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and Yersinia enterocolitica, which are responsible for a variety of um, human diseases. Um, Yersinia entomophaga seems to be an insect-specific pathogen. And so this work was part of a bigger um, uh, multi-group collaboration was focused on identifying candidate new biopesticides. And so Yersinia entomophaga became quite interesting for the simple reason that it seemed to secrete these very potent bacterial toxins that specifically targeted insects. And there was a tremendous interest in understanding what the virulence factors were that were responsible for this insecticidal activity uh, in the hope that it might be something that could be harnessed to develop new environmentally friendly biopesticides. So obviously the big question here is what is it in Yersinia entomophaga that kills, kills these insects, in particular Costelitra zelandica, but as you'll see later on, um, a wide range of insect pests, which are much more globally and economically significant. And so it was determined through a number of genetic experiments conducted primarily by my collaborator, Mark Hurst in New Zealand, that the main virulence determinants of Yersinia entomophaga were localized to this 32 kb pathogen in the island. And in particular, it was a series of genes, which you can see um, represented schematically in the genome here, um, which showed similarity to a recently described family of insecticidal toxin complexes or TCs. Um, so you can see the effect that, that these genes have on the pathogenicity of the organism. So when you knock out those genes, um, you have a relatively benign bacterium. Um, but uh, when, the, when the wild type bacterium is fed um, to a susceptible insect, you see that within 24 to 48 hours, it's a very drastic effect on the insect, which leads to its death um, soon thereafter ingesting it. So um, it was demonstrated both by genetic experiments as well as through um, mass spectrometry, isolation of the products of these genes and characterization of their old toxicity that, that indeed these genes here were acting synergistically to form some sort of protein complex, which, which was having this toxic effect. And so there was an interest in, in understanding better um, what, what these genes might look like in terms, or these gene products might look like in terms of their structure. Because while these genes have been described as insecticidal previously, uh, there was no known structures at the time that we embarked on this project. What was known is that they were similar um, to this, this gene island here that was first described in another insecticidal pathogen, Photorhabdus luminescence. And as I said, they belong to this TC family of toxins or ABC toxins, as we like to refer to them, because they're tripartite toxins that contain at least one representative of three different um, genes um, belonging to the TCA family, the TCB family, and the TCC family. And they're almost always um, identified within gene clusters, suggesting that they're very tightly co-expressed um, and co-regulated in terms of their expression. So uh, when they're expressed, they assemble into large multi-subunit complexes that are typically secreted by the bacterium. And as I said, they were first identified in this insecticidal pathogen, Photorhabdus luminescence. Now, before I get started on Yersinia entomophaga, I just want to talk a little bit about Photorhabdus luminescence because it's a very interesting bacteria if you haven't heard of it. Um, it's, it's perhaps most famously known as the, the bacterium that was discovered as being responsible for this phenomenon known as angel's glow. And so angel's glow is, is something that was documented um, in uh, many famous battles throughout history, perhaps most notably um, the American Civil War. Um, and so it was this, the student of a microbiologist, in, uh, this, sorry, the son of a microbiologist in America that became interested in this phenomenon known as angel's glow and was intrigued um, to know what it was that was causing this. And so he had heard about this bacterium, Photorhabdus luminescence, that had this very unusual property in that it's the only uh, terrestrial bacterium or non-marine bacterium 
that has this property of luminescence. And here you can see photoradius in, in, infecting um, uh, a particular species of grub. I think this is tobacco hornworm that you see in the bottom left-hand corner here. So it's very unusual to have a bacterium that naturally has this luminescent property um, outside of marine environments. And yet photoradius luminescence appears to, to have this very unusual characteristic. And this blue glow is something that was documented um, by survivors of, of war wounds in the Civil War. Um, where many people, of course, died from complications relating to bacterial infections associated with, with wounds incurred during the war. Um, and it had been documented that in some cases, people who were more likely to survive or had a better prognosis after being injured would report that their wounds would glow this faint blue colour at night. So through a series of experiments that were initiated by uh, a 17-year-old student of a microbiologist, it was eventually determined that actually photorabdus luminescence was the thing that was responsible for this phenomenon known as angel's glow. And so the reason that it was associated with this um, relatively good prognosis in terms of surviving war wounds is that it exists in this unique symbiotic relationship or unusual symbiotic relationship with a nematode host. Um, and so um, what it primarily does is it exists in symbiosis with the nematode that you see here and the nematode sources out a, a food source. Um, it kills an insect by secreting the bacterium into the gut of, of a susceptible food source. And then that bacterium in turn secretes toxins, which bioconvert the cadaver into nutrients. At the same time, uh, bacteria like photorabdus luminescence also secrete antibiotic compounds, which minimize competition from other microorganisms. And then that, that, um, that process generates a food source that allows the bacterium to reproduce, but also the nematode to reproduce. And you can see here the life cycle continues in this symbiotic pattern. So it's a really neat story about photorabdus luminescence. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, ABC toxins are one of uh, many uh, bacterial toxins that are found encoded within the genome of photorabdus luminescence and which indeed have insecticidal activity. But photorabdus luminescence is a little bit different to Yersinia entomophaga because it actually um, produces lots of, of toxic molecules. It's been described as, as one of the most toxic bacteria that exists because its genome literally encodes for many, many, many different uh, toxic proteins. And this is in contrast with Yersinia entomophaga because it seems as though in Yersinia entomophaga there are far fewer um, bacterial proteins that at least have characterized insecticidal toxicity. And certainly uh, the genes that encode for the components of this bacterial toxin, the NTC, uh, seem to be the predominant genes responsible for the toxicity of the organism. So here you can see a series of toxicity trials that were conducted against a range of insect pests of a varying economic and global significance. And in many cases, if not all cases where you see toxicity of the bacterium, you also see toxicity of the purified using entomophaga toxin complex, including against this guy here, which is quite interesting. This is Platella zoostella, also known as the diamond back moth, diamond back moth. And this is actually a very significant pest globally. It's, it's estimated to cause massive um, crop losses in green leafy vegetable crops around the world. And so developing new bioinsecticides against insect pests like this is re it's really, um, looking outside the sphere of structural biology, which I'm immediately interested in, is actually something that's a very significant challenge for us to face as a society globally, um, and one that requires concerted effort to overcome problems with acquired resistance and so forth. So Yersinia entomophaga provides a potential solution to, to these problems that some of these insect pest species provide. And we know that the NTC is the main virulence determinant of Yersinia entomophaga. So that then begs the question of, of what's the mechanism associated with insecticidal activity. And given that there were no structures of the NTC or related proteins at the time that we embarked on this project, we were certainly interested to try and answer that question. And so we started working together with Mark Hurst and also with the, um, the group of Sean Lott in New Zealand who have expertise in X-ray crystallography to characterize the components of this NTC assembly. And so over a period of several years, we were successful in, in characterizing all of the different components of the NTC. Um, initially, we sold low resolution structures um, of, of this TCA component that you see here. And, and subsequently, and more recently, um, work led by Sarah Piper, as well as Lou Briold in my lab at the time, um, led to the determination of cryo-EM structures of, of this TCA component of the NTC assembly. Uh, and preceding that, um, we also worked together with Sean Lott's group and Jason Busby, a PhD student in his lab, to determine the crystal structure of this TCBC component or the NBC component of the toxin. So here you have the three different character characteristic genes that make up uh, an ABC toxin. You have the A genes, the B genes, and the C genes, and they contribute to these two separable components of the toxin. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these structures and, and, and what we learned from them before I move on to some more recent work. Um, but just to quickly summarise, um, I guess, the functional insights that are gained from these, these structures and the information that we have today. Um, so you can think of the NTC as being a prototypical example of this subfamily of, of this family of ABC toxins, which we now like to think of as being a, a functionally analogous subfamily to a much more larger and wider family of bacterial pore forming toxins known as binary toxins. And so to borrow the analogy or the, or the terminology that's used to describe the function of binary toxins, these are comprised of two separable components, an active component and a binding component. And so they're usually referred to as AB toxins, but that terminology when we apply it to ABC toxins can be a little bit confusing because the A and the B are reversed compared to the TCA and the TCB components. So I'll just try and refer to them as being the active component and the binding component rather than AB toxins. So they have molecular weights of around 1.5 to 2.5 megadaltons. Uh, and the two components are often encoded by multiple large genes co-located in a single pathogenicity island. And so this is where ABC toxins are a little bit different to your prototypical binary toxins in that these, these two separable components are often encoded for by multiple genes. So in the case of the active component, it's usually encoded for by two genes, but sometimes we see gene fusions, uh, meaning that it's encoded by a single gene. And the binding component is encoded by anywhere from one to four genes. And the example that I'm going to talk about today, you see Intimophaga is an example of one that's encoded by four genes here, which is one of the more complex versions of the toxin. So I first want to talk about the active component of the toxin. And before I do that, I'll just get my pointer sorted out. So to talk about the active component of the toxin, as I said, we solved the structure of this using X-ray crystallography working in collaboration uh, with Sean Lott's group at the University of Auckland. And so this is a 240 kilodalton complex, and it's a really nice example of a cooperatively folded structure because what you can see here is that the NB protein, which is coloured in magenta, red, and green, basically forms a continuous beta spiral with the Yen C structure, which is colored in blue and cyan. And so there's, there's basically no interruptions to that continuous fold when you go from the C terminus of Yen B to the N terminus of Yen C. And in total, we have 90 beta strands, which make up this spiraling um, predominantly beta structure, which is capped at one end by a beta propeller, and it's capped at the other end by something called an RHS associated core domain, which is shown in cyan here. Now you'll notice in this structure, that um, there's a part of ENC that we don't actually see in the structure. And I'll explain um, the reason for that in a moment. But before I get to that, I just wanted to highlight the fact that this is the first um, example of a structure of a so-called RHS repeat containing protein. So RHS repeat containing proteins uh, are found throughout bacteria. And as you'll see in a moment, they're actually also found throughout eukaryotes as well. And they're characterized by the, the presence of this RHS consensus sequence, um, which is a short, uh, roughly 15 amino acid sequence which has a, a very strongly conserved central YD dipeptide. Um, and as is evident in our structure, you can see that that RHS repeat is actually a single strand turn strand motif. Um, and so this was something that was not known previously in the absence of structural data. What we found is that wherever there was a predicted RHS repeat bioinformatically, you had this um, very striking strand turn strand repeat. And in fact, because we had so many of these in a single structure, one of the things that we were able to do with this was to refine the actual consensus sequence for the RHS repeat. And we found that almost all of these strand turn strand motifs here fit the RHS repeat sequence when you refine it uh, based on the parameters of this structure. It also allowed us to discover um, um, a, a wider distribution of RHS repeat containing proteins, which is something I'll talk about in a second. Um, but before I get to that, I wanted to talk about the purpose of this beta spiral structure. So what it's actually doing is it's generating a large internal unfilled cavity. And so you'll remember that I said that part of the structure is missing. We don't see it in our structure. And that's because um, when we purified the protein, we found that this C-terminal domain was readily cleaved or enzymatically released from the rest of the protein. And so in order to increase our chances of getting a crystal structure, what we did was we actually generated a construct that didn't have this C-terminal region, which is bioinformatically characterized as a hypervariable region. And so what was interesting is that that RHS core domain that plugs the top of the complex actually points down into this large cavity. And so we hypothesized that maybe whatever's encoded at the C-terminus here is actually accommodated within this cavity. And we were able to show through a series of size exclusion and SACS experiments that indeed that's the case. So the question then became what's responsible for the proteolytic activity that releases this C-terminal region that we were seeing in, in our purification experiments. 
And it turns out that this highly conserved RHS core domain folds into what's known as a cryptic aspartic protease motif. And when you mutate the catalytic aspartate shown in the structure here, you no longer get cleavage of that C-terminal region and you instead have a complete um, Yen C protein forming a complex with Yen B. So basically what this tells us is that we have this, this really neat cooperatively folded structure that accommodates a hypervariable region of the C-terminus. And it turns out that this hypervariable region is actually usually um, a cytotoxic molecule. And this is what's responsible for the fundamental cytotoxic activity of um, ABC toxin complexes. It's encoded at this C-terminus here, and it's encapsulated within this protective cocoon, which it's able to cleave from in cis so that the cytotoxic domain is actually freely um, bouncing around within this, this capsule here and able to get out once some sort of stimulus triggers release or opening of this beta propeller domain. So that was a really neat example of an RHS protein and, and the first example of an RHS protein. And as I said, we were able to refine that RHS consensus sequence based on what we saw in this crystal structure and go looking for other RHS repeat containing proteins, which may or may not be functionally related. And so just to take a very quick detail before I come back to talk about ABC toxins, I wanted to show you a very recent structure that we've solved of another RHS repeat protein um, from bacteria. This one is found in E. coli and it's known quite creatively as RHSA. And you can see here comparing the, the, the sequence of RHSA or the, or the domain structure of RHSA to YNBC, it's a much smaller protein. It's only a single protein, but it has this large stretch of RHS repeat sequences. And when we solved the structure using cryoEM very recently, um, what we found is that unsurprisingly, these RHS repeats again form this strand turn strand motif, and they're again forming this large um, hollow cage-like structure that's well suited, we think, to encapsulating something. So what's RHSA encapsulating? Well, it turns out that the C-terminus of RHSA also encodes for a cytotoxin. And in this case, it's actually partnered with a cognate immunity protein known as UBAE. And bioinformatically, we think that the C-terminal cytotoxin of RHSA is an RNAs. Um, the other thing that we know is that from some very recent work that's been published by some other groups working in this field is that these RHS proteins are actually type 6 secretion system associated effectors. And so they have a very conserved amino acid sequence at their end terminus um, up here somewhere that actually interacts um, with the, the, the needle tip of a type 6 secretion system. And so it seems that these are bona fide type 6 secretion system effectors, which are delivered by the canonical type 6 secretion system mechanism. And so, and, and they have these, these cognate immunity proteins, which is also something that's characteristic of effectors associated with type 6 secretion systems. So, so what we can conclude from this is that, is that maybe RHS repeat sequences are these generalizable building blocks for, for this cage-like structure that likes to encapsulate uh, potentially toxic proteins. And what's interesting, as I said, is that we also found some evidence that these were present in eukaryotes. The uh, consensus sequence that defines them was separately defined as a YD repeat sequence. And again, I come back to the point that there's this very heavily conserved central YD dipeptide, which characterizes both the YD repeat and the RHS repeat. And so it turns out that, that these are probably exactly the same thing and that eukaryotes have just borrowed them from prokaryotes for exactly the same purpose, that being um, to package uh, toxic or otherwise sensitive proteins um, within this protective shell. And so um, an example that's not from our lab, but one that was published by a couple of other groups working in this space um, is the structure of this protein here, tenurin, which came along subsequent to our work on, on the NBC complex. Um, and which showed that again, you have this characteristic YD or RHS repeat rich shell, which packages uh, something internally. Um, and in this case, what's being packaged is a neuronal signaling molecule that's important in the very early stages of neuronal cell development. So that's kind of my little detour into RHS repeat proteins. I now want to come back onto ABC toxin and talk about the binding component of ABC toxins. So that NBC structure is the active component. This now is the structure of the binding component. And, and this is a, a cryo-EM structure um, that was sold from data collected by Lou Briolt, who was a PhD student in my lab. Uh, and the structure determination and interpretation was done by Sarah Piper, who was also previously a PhD student in my lab. And, and I think I saw her in the audience today now working down at, at MIPS. So um, here you see the cryo-EM map shown on the left-hand side has a resolution of around 4.4 angstroms. So not particularly impressive by today's standard, but still well and truly enough in order for us to build an isotomic model of this structure, which you can see on the right-hand side here. So this is a co-complex of two different TCA-like proteins, Yen A1 and Yen A2. And there are some very flexible regions of this structure, um, which are evident in the map 
um, but which I've circled over here just to really highlight them. And we refer to these as the arm and the leg regions of the structure, because they kind of move around freely and independently of the body of the structure, which is this, this pore forming device that you see here. So the other thing that I want to point out is that these flexible regions aren't actually um, fully modelled in this structure. And, and what we were able to show when we looked at um, structures that were thresholded at a much lower cutoff is that there are additional densities which accommodate these two elements of the NTCA structure, which are, which are quite unique to NTCA and not seen of any any not seen, pardon me, in any other structures that belong to this toxin subfamily. So these are um, functional enzymes, they're chitinases, and we solved the structure of both of these using X-ray crystallography, again, in collaboration with Sean Watts lab. We've shown that they are actually functional and that they're able to hydrolyze chitin like all chitinases do. Um, and we're also able to show that they fit very nicely into these very flexible domains that are sort of at the end of the arm and the leg region. So you can kind of think of these as being the hand and the foot of the NTC, if you like, connected to the body of the complex by the arm and the leg domains. So um, we've been very curious for a while about what these chitinases are doing. We have a couple of hypotheses and, and to explain one of those hypotheses in a little bit more detail, I first need to show you what this structure looks like when you reconstitute into a liposome or a lipid membrane. And so here now you see a lower resolution structure of uh, the NTCA complex and it's been reconstituted into liposomes. Um, and to get the complex to undergo this drastic conformational change, one of the things that we usually need to do is mild, mildly destabilize the structure. And in this case, um, we introduce a, a very low concentration of denaturant, much lower than the concentrations that would be used to completely denature the structure, but sufficient to slightly destabilize it and then reconstitute it in the presence of liposomes in this case. So here you can see a nine angstrom structure, which doesn't allow for model building de novo, but does allow for us to sort of fit the different parts of the complex as rigid bodies and get a bit of an understanding for what the conformational rearrangements are that are going on here. And perhaps the most striking of those is the movement of this central preformed alpha helical pore from what was previously an enclosed um, um, conformation within this outer shell um, down into this very exposed conformation where it's inserting into liposomal membrane. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this seminar series, you'll recognize that this is very, very similar uh, to a conformational change that was documented for the photorabbis luminescence toxins. And, and so Stefan also gave a very nice talk on this a few weeks ago, and I, I certainly don't want to um, go over again the very nice work that he showed, but that, that his group um, working in parallel with ours um, was able to show cryo-EM and X-ray structures of the photorabbis toxin complex in its pre-pore and its pore state with constituents with the nanodisks and in so doing, visualize in much more structural detail that the, comp the same conformational change that we see in, in our more moderate resolution uh, liposome embedded map. So you can see here a slight opening up of the surrounding upper helical shell, um, the, the central translocation pore driving down into the cell membrane and penetrating the cell membrane. And schematically, there's been a representation here that, that the outer surface of this shell is interacting with an as yet unidentified, or at the time that this work was done, an unidentified cell surface receptor. What's interesting about this is that um, highlighted in different colors on the surface of the TCDA1 structure that you see here are these putative receptor binding domains. They all be the sandwich folds and they're all potentially implicated um, in receptor recognition based on their position in the structure. And also the fact that the beta sandwich fold is something that commonly facilitates protein, protein and protein glycan interactions. Now, if you compare the structure of the photorabbis luminescence toxin complex, with the structure of our NTC complex, what you find is that curiously, these chitinases sit in a region that would likewise suggest they might be involved in receptor recognition. So here you see the relative location of the putative RBDs in the photorabbis luminescence toxin complex. Here you see the location of the chitinases in our NTC structure. And so we next asked the question whether these chitinases might be facilitating some sort of um, receptor recognition event leading to association with a, a predefined membrane surface. And so we embarked on a glycan array screen where we first screened uh, the entire Yersinia intimophagotoxin complex and looked for binding uh, to glycans on this colorimetric um, chip assay. And so what we found was a lot of hits, which is not uncommon for these types of experiments because, because they're not necessarily picking up everything that's a very specific interaction. They're just uh, a binary signal that represents binding or no binding. Um, and so we got in total 64 hits um, to a variety of different types of glycans. And to try and narrow down the significance of these hits, we then also in parallel 
screened against isolated CHI-1 and CHI-2 working on the assumption that these might be responsible for receptor recognition. And we then looked at hits that were conserved between the CHI-1 and the CHI-2 hits and also between the NTC hits. And this narrowed the data set down substantially to a total um, of only 16 glycans that you can see represented schematically here. Now, some of these are very, very simple glycan motifs. Some of them are only single sugars and disaccharides. Some of them are a little bit more complex. And these are the ones that we think are more interesting because they potentially uh, might represent uh, a receptor or part of a receptor recognition motif. And so we've been able to validate the results that we saw in our glycan array screen using SPR. And we found that we actually see quite tight binding to especially the more complex glycans, uh, things that are in the, the tens of nanomolar ranges, suggesting that this, this interaction might be something that is facilitating a physiologically significant binding event. And so in parallel with trying to understand the, the chemical basis of a receptor recognition, we've also been looks at, looking at this at a cellular level. And so working together with uh, Sam Stebbins, my colleague up here at the University of Queensland, we've used live cell imaging approaches to visualize toxin uptake by um, uh, mammalian epithelial cells in this case. Um, you can see here some quite nice uh, 3D images showing that the toxin labeled in purple or blue is being taken up clearly um, into, into, the, um, into the cells that are, that are shown um, by the boundary of the life act GFP marker here. So you can see that in the 3D visual that you see here. You can also see it in this, these cut through views um, that are shown in the X and the Y axis here. So clearly we're seeing toxin uptake in the cells in this model. And so the next question we wanted to ask is whether this toxin uptake is glycan dependent. So we explored whether we saw this same phenomenon um, in, in a cell line where we could deplete cell surface glycans and, and specifically N-linked cell surface glycans. And indeed, what we saw was a difference in the uptake profiles. So not a complete ablation of uptake, but certainly a difference in the profiles when the cells are depleted of N-linked glycans on the cell surface. So here you see the wild type um, cells being treated with toxin. Here you see um, the N-glycan deficient cells being um, treated with toxin. And while there's still uptake of these of the toxin in, in this um, glycan deficient cell line, um, the uptake process, the kinetics of the uptake is, is very, very different. And if you look very closely, you can also see that, that um, it even looks like the uptake might be occurring via a different pathway because we see these very large, dense globular aggregates um, in the treated cell lines, whereas in, in the wild type cell lines, we see um, a much more normal punctate pattern of, of cell uptake, which is more like what we might expect to see. Um, so, so that's that's a, an assay that we've developed and a system that we're using now to look at some other aspects of, of cell uptake, um, which I don't want to talk too more about too much more about today because I'd like to get back onto talking uh, more about the structure, uh, given that that's something that's that's of primary interest um, to the people that are in the audience today. But just to summarise. Uh, where we are at so far with this work. So we determined structures of the separate components of the NTC. Um, and in, in doing so, we'd come up with an explanation for the mechanism of associated, uh, mechanism of activity, pardon me, associated with the active component of the NTC. So the TCBC complex or the MBC complex. And basically we showed that this is an RHS repeat containing protein, that it has this um, self-cleaving aspartic protease motif, which releases the cytotoxic enzyme from the C-terminus of that assembly into this capsule where it can later be released by some sort of external trigger. And we've also um, been able to develop some insights into how the binding component may recognize and interact with host cell membranes by looking at the structure of that component, the constituent into liposomes, and also starting to look at what the determinants of cell surface recognition might be. But what's missing from this picture at the moment is, is what does the full holotoxin assembly look like? And, and more importantly, what we'd like to know is if we know what the holotoxin assembly looks like, are there additional insights that this can offer into the function of this system? So um, this now is the structure solved more recently of the holotoxin assembly. Um, and you can see here the NBC complex sitting very nicely on top of, of the TCA assembly, which includes the chitinases that are shown in orange. And so here we have uh, a single monomer of the TCA assembly and a monomer of the BC. So this uh, TCA assembly is actually um, present in a five-fold symmetry. So there's five copies of this whole TCA protomer here, um, and there's only a single copy of the NBC complex. So there's actually a symmetry break at the interface between the TCBC and the TCA component. Now, what this uh, representation of the structure shows you is the way that the model was built. And there's a couple of things that I'd like to point out here, which are potentially of interest. 
Uh, one is that um, we initially built this structure using a crystal structure of the NBC and Sarah's cryo-EM structure of the NA complex. But in Sarah's structure, there were um, a few parts of the complex which were ambiguous, which we couldn't build structures for. And so in this holotoxin structure, we've actually been able to complete the model now. The resolution is slightly improved, but what's actually much more improved is the resolution anisotropy of this structure. And so that allowed us to, to build some of these flexible regions of the structure with much more clarity um, and, and much more confidence. And so you can see these are color-coded according to the way that they were built. So we have um, our PDB models for both the chitinases as well as the, the um, cryo-EM structure of the NA component and the X-ray structure of the NBC complex. And you can see here that the, the bits of the NA structure that were missing were built by one of two different methods. In the case of this ARM domain, um, we were able to build this de novo directly into the map density. And this was also something that was forming an intricately assembled complex with the N-terminal domain of CHI-2, which we hadn't seen in our crystal structure previously either. And I'll talk some more about that, that interface in a moment. And the second was the, the structure of the leg domain, which we initially built um, using an alpha fold model. So we had tried um, for many, many years to try and uh, obtain a map that had sufficient clarity to allow us to build um, this leg domain. We also tried for many, many years to try and predict the structure of this leg domain and all of the available protein structure prediction methods for this failed abysmally. And as soon as AlphaFold2 re was released, I tried inserting the sequence into AlphaFold2 and it immediately gave us a structure which, which looked very, very similar to the lower resolution map density we had here. So this is really a, a very nice example of the success of AlphaFold2 in predicting uh, difficult to model structures. And so this also allowed us to, to come up with a, a model for the interface between the leg domain um, and a very short N-terminal peptide of CHI-1. And we've, we've validated that model using uh, cross-linking mass spectrometry as well as molecular dynamic simulations. And we're pretty confident that this is an accurate representation of what that interface looks like. So what I wanna do is I wanna talk about this holotoxin structure now, and I wanna talk in particular about um, what we see in this holotoxin structure, which is different to what we saw in the two separate components and why that's interesting. And so the first thing that's different um, probably is no surprise, and it's the interface between the BC component and the A component, which is where that symmetry break occurs. So we only have an asymmetric copy of the TCBC component, the MBC component, but we have a pentameric uh, symmetry in the TCA component. And when you fit the component structures into the EM density map of the holotoxin, what you find is that the TCA component matches the EM density of the holotoxin almost perfectly, suggesting there is very little conformational rearrangement, at least of the backbone of the symmetrical part of the structure. Where the most drastic changes occur is in the plug domain of the NBC complex or the TCBC complex. And you can see that the, the crystal structure density doesn't fit the map density at all. And so in fact, what's going on here is when you generate a simple animation morph, you can see that this results in an opening up of the pore um, of the plug rather at the bottom of the BC complex. Um, and when you overlay this with the photoradvis luminescence, the corresponding structure from photoradvis luminescence, you see that this conformational change is completely conserved. Now, again, I don't want to go over um, the, the examples that, that were presented by Stefan Raunter of what happens in photoradvis luminescence, but his, work, his group have done some very nice work where they've incorporated MD simulations into their structural data and shown that there's a very complex um, unfolding and refolding event which, um, which likely accompanies this opening up of the plug domain to allow the cytotoxic enzyme to escape down into the TCA pore lumen. What I did want to highlight though, is the fact that this, this very strongly conserved structural rearrangement explains very elegantly some observations that were made as many as 15 years ago, where people had noticed that they could recombine uh, the genetic components of different toxins into a single organism and produce functional chimeric polytoxins. And in this particular example here, was one where they took two different toxins from Xenorhabdus, um, Xenorhabdus nematophila, which had differing um, insect specificity. And when they mixed and made chimeric or hybrid toxins, they were able to change the, the insect specificity by, by mixing the TCA components with different BC components. But people have also done similar experiments where they've taken not just um, components from different toxin islands within the same species, but actually components from completely different species and combine them and they do form functional holotoxin. And this structural data perfectly explains why that's the case. So it's quite interesting and worth noting, I think. So the second thing that I wanted to talk about is, is the new parts of the structure that we were able to see. So that, that interface is something that 
is an example of a structural change in the holotoxin. These aren't necessarily structural changes, but they're parts of the structure that we hadn't seen previously in the individual component structures. And the first of those is this arm region of the structure. And at first we thought that this fold actually looked very similar to the, the putative receptor binding domain that's inserted into a similar region of the photoradrous luminescence shell. But upon closer inspection, it actually turns out that, that the insertion site is, is very slightly different. So um, here you can see in the photoradrous, in the corresponding photoradrous luminescence structure, you had this, this very nice example of a beta sandwich fold inserted between two alpha helices that form that TCA core um, that surrounds the central core domain. Um, and, and there's a loop between these two alpha helices here, which is actually where the corresponding domain of Yusinia entomophaga is inserted. And rather than seeing complete deletion of the, the RBDA domain, as it's called, from photoradrous luminescence, we actually see some residual structure still remaining, but it's certainly not a beta sandwich fold anymore. And you can see that that's, that's um, confirmed when you do a sequence alignment as well. You can see that these are inserted into very different parts of this alpha helical backbone of the structure, despite the fact that, that, that they both form in beta sandwich folds. Now, the other thing is that if you try to superimpose these two domains on top of one another, um, the RMSD is actually not very good. They're both examples of beta sandwich folds, but they're actually um, quite different structurally for two proteins that belong to the same domain family. And so when we did a structural comparison of our arm domain with, um, with other structural homologs found in the PDB, what we found is that it's most similar to these components of T-cell receptors, uh, but also um, to this bacterial protein, CFAE, which is a two-domain protein that forms the base of a bacterial fibrate structure. So here you see CFAE. Um, it has two domains known as an adhesin domain and a pillin domain. Um, and what it does is it actually forms fimbrae structures by accepting a donor strand from a corresponding beta sandwich structure. Um, and, and the building block of that is that CFAB protein that you see down the bottom of this structure here. So we examined our arm domain in the context of the complex that it forms with the chitinase that's bound in the hand position known as chi2. And what we found is that actually this, this, this assembly mechanism that you see in, in the fimbrae structure formed by CFAE is something that seems to be borrowed by the CHI2 and terminal domain in the way that it interacts with the arm domain, where you have this donor beta strand um, from the N terminal domain of CHI2, and it's sitting in this hydrophobic pocket that allows it to form this very tight association with the arm domain of um, the NA1. And so that's very interesting. Now, um, when we compare the leg domain of um, the, the TCA structure to other known um, insecticidal toxic complex structures, what we find is that the differences are much more subtle. So here you can see still a beta sandwich domain, um, but allowing incorporation of this CHI2 domain and, and actually belonging to quite a different family of beta sandwich proteins. In the case of the leg domain, what we found is that the RMSD comparison of the leg domain of the NA2 with these RBD regions of, of the TCDA1 structure the photoradrous luminescence toxin complex is, is much more favorable. So the RMSD is only around two to three angstroms. Um, the sequences align quite well, the Z scores are quite good. And say for a few uh, individual insertions, they, they look like they superimpose quite well. So this, this leg domain of ENA2 seems to be a more canonical insecticidal toxin complex like beta sandwich fold, if you like, if you want to describe it as that. But what's very striking about this part of the structure is that the position of that leg domain is very different. And that's emphasized in this overlay that you see here, where we've taken all of the available um, structures of, of TCA-like proteins and superimposed them on top of one another. And here you can see the position of the photoradrous luminescence RBDs. And here you see the position of the leg domain, which is responsible for binding Chi1 in the Yersinia entomophaga toxin complex. And hopefully you can appreciate that there's a fairly significant rearrangement there. Okay, so, so what happens next is, is you can see that we can animate this, this rearrangement in a way that emphasizes that movement. So here you see the static structures of, of the different TCA components. Um, and in this movie, which I think is gonna play, you can see that, that rearrangement that takes place there, the swinging out of the leg domain. Now, we ask the question of why do we see this down conformation in the TCA structure of this in compared to the up conformation that you see in almost every other structure. And it turns out that when you bring Chi1 in the mix, it initially looks like it can be incorporated quite nicely. Um, but when you then introduce the neighboring protomers, you start to see a clash, which creates problems for, 
for incorporating all of these leg domains in the up conformation. Okay, so I'm going to move quite quickly because I can realize that, that we're going to run out of time if I don't move through this last bit quickly. So, so here I'm now comparing the poor form structure of the MTC with the, the sorry, the poor form structure with the pre poor structure. Um, and something that I wanted to point out here is some differences that we also see in our pre poor in our poor form structure inserted into lipid nanodisc um, compared to some of the other structures, in particular the photoradius luminescence um, poor form structure, which is shown on the right hand side here. The most striking difference we see is that the pore actually seems to push down further out of that surrounding alpha helical shell in Yersinia entomophaga than it does in photoradius luminescence. And that's because this alpha helical peptide, which is formed from this, this flexible linker domain, docks against the inside of the TCB binding domain rather than against the top of the alpha helical pore. We also see a more significant widening of the surrounding alpha helical shell than what we see in the photoradius structure. And this is despite the fact that there's a very high degree of sequence conservation between the two toxins, about 35% identity in this region, about 70% sequence conservation in this region. So th this brings me to a bit of a summary of this work where, you know, at, at this stage, it's not clear whether what we've captured are di structural differences between the NTC and the photoradius toxin in particular, or whether we've captured distinct points on a shared molecular trajectory or pathway. And so we could summarize this as, as, as four different states, which may be a single pathway or may actually reflect gen, genuine structural differences between the two different types of toxins. So here you see uh, those leg domains represented in the up conformation, which can then potentially move into the down conformation. We hypothesize that these are responsible for interacting with cell surface receptors. And then you get insertion of the transmembrane pore into the lipid bilayer um, and in the photoradius structure, it, it's penetrating out of the shell, but in the Yersinia entomophaga structure, it's actually penetrating further out of the shell. Likely not straight through the membrane like we see here, but possibly um, the, the complex sits higher on the membrane or interacts with a more elongated receptor. Now, I realize I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm gonna skip the next few things that I had in just in case there was time to talk about them. And just very, very quickly, if I can have uh, three minutes to talk about the Joel cryoarms at UQ, is that all right, Mayada? Yep, cool. Okay. So um, as I mentioned at the start, we at UQ have recently moved to a new platform for, for cryo-electron microscopy. So um, we've been doing cryo-EM for quite some time. Um, we've been doing high-resolution cryo-EM since we got this K2 detector in 2015. Uh, but in 2019, we moved to the Joel CryoArm platform um, and officially embarked on construction of a new cryo-EM facility. So this was something that um, we began a demolition and a refurbishment process in early 2019. We received our microscopes at the end of 2019, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you that this was really, really horrible, horrible timing because um, shortly after the microscopes were put together, we entered a global pandemic and, and lots of closed border scenarios and those sort of things. So we were basically forced to embark on a period where we had a very new technology. This was the fifth cryo arm microscope that was installed in the world. Um, we had very limited support um, or very limited access to the outside world because of the closed border situation, the reluctance of people to travel. And, and we were basically trying to set this up from the get-go. And so we had probably more teething problems than, than people would normally expect to encounter in setting up a cryo-EM facility. But I'm happy to report that, that um, thanks to the really hard work of a lot of people, including people at Joel and the cryo-EM community at UQ, we've been able to get some really nice results out of these microscopes. So here you see some of the first structures that were solved on them. Most notably, this, um, this protein on the left-hand side here is something that I'm sure you would recognize just from looking at it. This is actually the UQ S-clamp antigen, which is the major component of uh, UQ's candidate vaccine for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which was developed and taken to, phase, to a phase one clinical trial. Um, and so this is one of the first structures that was solved in the cryo instruments at UQ. Now, without getting into the specifics of this particular project, um, you probably know that this vaccine is no longer going ahead. It's going ahead in the modified form, um, but this particular structure wasn't taken forward because there was a complication in the phase one clinical trial where um, there was a false positive result returned against a HIV diagnostic test, which was considered to be not favorable for further development by the, by the biotech companies. Um, we've also done characterization of ferritin to demonstrate you know, that we can get to high resolution with these instruments. And um, perhaps the most significant result to show today is this one here, where we've got a 1.5 angstrom resolution structure of ferritin collected on our ARM 300, equipped with a K3 camera from data that was collected in 1.5 hours. 
We also get the very nice resolution with the ARM 200. And it's probably worth pointing out here that a major difference between the ARM 200 and the old Arctica technology or the more recent Glacios technology is that this column actually has a built-in energy filter. And so in the days before the Selectris camera, um, this was one of um, a really nice way to be able to get uh, an energy filter into a 200 kV microscope. Um, and so this, this here just shows you some benchmarking of our structures compared to some of the highest reported resolution structures when we plot resolution versus number of particles. And you can see here that we're not doing too badly, especially considering um, that you know, this was not a project that was aiming to set new resolution records or anything like that. It was just a, a benchmarking experiment to show that the microscopes worked well and could collect high resolution data. So one example I just wanted to very quickly show uh, before skipping on to the, end, to the summary slide is to revisit this structure of RHSA, this RHS containing protein, um, which is one of the subsequent structures that we solved in our cryo arms. And so if you have a keen eye, you would notice that here I've shown the structure of RHSA as a ribbon diagram. Here I've shown um, the density map and you can see that there is some density at the top of this structure, which hasn't been modeled here. And we were curious about what this density might be. Um, turns out that um, using a really elegant combination of techniques, we were able to identify this as an endogenously expressed E. coli peptidylprolyl cis-trans isomerase. Um, so PPIB is what it's known as. And so this is actually binding to a proline-rich loop on the surface of the protein, and we think it's helping to, to fold that proline-rich loop on the surface of RHSA. And this was something that we were able to identify um, and diagnose as the binding part of base solely on the cryo-EM data that we collected off, off the microscopes here at UQ, which was a nice outcome. I'm going to skip that very recent structure, despite the fact that it's got a very nice rendering by Piper Protein Productions, um, and finish up by showing you a very recent structures of the NTC collected on the cryo arm microscopes here at UQ. So you can see in this plot here, we've pushed the structure out to around 2.8 angstroms now. And in fact, the most recent structure we've collected is this one here, which has a resolution inside the mask of 2.45 angstroms. Um, so this was collected on our cryo arm 300 instrument fitted with a Gatan K3 camera and an in-column overgate energy filter. Um, there's significant conformational heterogeneity in those chitinase regions, which is why they're excluded from the mask in this particular refinement. And the BC complex is also masked out when you impose five-fold symmetry. But a nice thing to point out about this structure is that because this seems to be a less stable form of the complex, it was necessary to add 20% glycerol to the mix for the cryo-EM here. Um, and despite the fact that we had 20% glycerol in our sample, it's still the highest resolution structure we have of the NTC to date at a resolution of 2.45 angstroms. And so that's a very nice piece of work that was done by my PhD student, Solis Roach, who I think is also in the audience today. So to summarize very quickly, and I apologize, I've taken a little bit more time than I planned to, um, but in summary, ABC toxins have separable membrane binding and pore forming um, activities, which can be separated from the cytotoxic activity of the complex. And so the NTC represents an unusual recently evolved ABC toxin subtype with clear structural differences in architecture and structure to other ABC toxins, including the very well characterized system from photorabous luminescence, which some of you will already know about. Um, so I think the cryo played a pivotal role in elucidating the, the, the mechanisms that underpin the assembly, packaging, localization, and delivery of the cytotoxins that are delivered by these assemblies. Uh, and finally, as I showed a very small appetizer of at the end there, um, we're now in a position where the Joel cryo arm systems at UQ are, are really well-established platforms for single particle cryo -EM, And we're looking forward to producing and publishing a lot more data from them in the very near future. So keep your eyes out. Okay, so I'll just acknowledge the people that are involved, the collaborators and, and the people in my lab who I mentioned throughout the talk. And in particular, the members of the UQ cryo -EM community who've really worked very productively together to um, demonstrate that these new systems are working well and, and get them up and running in collaboration with our our industry colleagues at Joel. So I'll wrap the talk up there. Um, thank you for listening and invite any questions in the, in the seven or so minutes that we've got left. Thank you so much, Michael, for the very interesting seminar and congratulations on the digital cryo arm facility. And now uh, the room is open for questions. So. Um, I might ask a question if I can. Sure. Hi, Patrick. Uh, I might have missed it, Michael. Um, uh, did you 
um, try and do structures with the mutants where you, you've removed the cleavage site on the toxin and, and do you see, if you've tried that, you know, do you then see density of the toxin in the cavity? Um, so we haven't, we haven't solved structures of, okay, so I can answer that question two, in two ways. Um, Stefan Ronce's lab have done exactly that experiment where they mutated the cleavage site to show, um, to show that um, the toxin was retained within the cage. And so they did that structurally. We did it with SDS page gels. Um, and, but then when you look at those structures to see whether you can see density, um, you, so, so their observations are very similar to what we've seen with the, with the wild type toxin. So initially, initially when we did the crystal structure work, we removed the C-terminal domain, but when we did the EM work, we're working with native proteins. And so they all contain the C-terminal domain. Um, and we do see density within the cage, um, but it's very difficult to discern what that density is. It certainly doesn't look like folded protein. Um, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it very much today, but the internal surface of that cage um, is very reminiscent of a protein like GROEL. So it looks a lot like the inside of a chaperone. So our working hypothesis, which seems to be entirely consistent with the data that we've collected and also consistent with the point mutant data that Stefan's lab has collected, is that basically the inside of that cage structure is stabilizing the toxin in an unfolded state, which then allows it to basically thread out of the pore um, in, a, in an unfolded state and it folds when it exits the pore into the cytoplasm. Thanks, that makes sense. Okay, uh, does anyone have more questions? Um. I'll ask one if nobody asks a question. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Hi, Sarah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, obviously I have a lot of biological questions <laughs> about that project since I left, but I was actually wondering how often you use the faceplate given that you, like, have you used it, for example, for the smaller proteins? Um, when you collect the data set on the um, RHS repeat proteins or are you using it for tomography or are you using it like throughout? Yeah, so we, we haven't used face plates at all for single particle work. Um, obviously the energy filter is, is in column and we use it all the time, um, but we haven't done any imaging with face plates, including for the, the um, smaller protein. So, so the RHSA protein that I showed there, that's that's a 140 kilodalton protein that is primarily beta sheet and no alpha helices. And so that was a really challenging target and took lots and lots of repeated efforts to get really thin ice and nice orientations and those sort of things. And, and we'd actually, you probably know this, that we had about three or four goes at collecting data um, on different instruments around the world. I won't, I won't name any facilities that we went to because I'm, I'm not, I don't want to name and shame microscopes or give the impression that different microscopes weren't as good as ours. But um, but the first time that we got that structure to fall out was when we collected the data on the cryo arms. Um, so so no face plates, but um, it was a very challenging structure, and, and I'm I'm quite certain that the energy filter is important, and possibly also the coherence of the cold peg is possibly important as well. Um, and that and that's a little bit consistent with um, some of the comparisons that we've done that I rushed over a little bit at the end, but we often see better better resolution of structures from fewer particles than what you would on average see reported in the literature. Obviously, um, you know, there are certain groups that have access to the latest technologies from different vendors and, and when they really try and push and collect the best data, um, they, they do as, as well or better than us. Um, but we're not really in the business of trying to, trying to squeeze out record resolutions or anything like that. And I think that we find that on average, we're getting to similar resolutions or better from those particles. And so I think that that is probably a combination of the the um, the energy filter and the cold feed system because we haven't really done a lot of work with the faceplate at all. Does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, is there anyone has more questions? Okay, uh, actually, have uh, I have a question? Okay, for the recent ENTC holotoxin. Um, uh, structure uh, that you have mentioned uh, using uh, cryo arm. What was the lipid mimetic system that you used? Was it nanodisc? Uh, 
or yeah so the recent one was lipid nanodisc that right yeah so 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 that was actually data that was collected by sarah as well during a phd um and the images were acquired on our old tf30 microscope so we we're working on um trying to get uh trying to optimize that prep and also to get a high resolution pore film structure at the moment in nanodiscs um, but yeah, so that was that's a, that's still a significant improvement over the liposome embedded structure, which was the first one that I showed. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, thank you so much, Michael, for today's seminar, and thanks for all audience who attended the seminar today. And please remember that the date for upcoming seminar will be held on December thirteenth, and our guest speaker is Dr. Kleiman Verba. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Uh, bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you.